Welcome to the third part of lecture one. We've been talking now about um, the very first topic, really, that's new in this particular course, and that's called error and control systems. The objectives of this part, what you should know by the end of this, is that uh, what error is in linear control, control systems, and really why it's important. Uh, we'll look at how to find the steady state er error and what the steady state error happens to mean. By the way, whenever I write something in red, okay, this means important. All right, so it should be something that you'd try to remember, whereas other times I'll just write stuff in black and it's not such a big deal. Okay, so how to find the steady state error for unity feedback systems, uh, systems that have disturbance inputs, uh, for example, step, wrap, ramp, and parabola, and non-unity feedback systems. Um, what we'll see in this last case is that non-unity feedback systems actually uh, can be converted into unity feedback uh, systems, and then we can use that to get our steady state error calculation taken care of. We'll also look at how to design the system's parameters to meet performance specs. And what I mean by that is, is how, to, how to design the system so that you get the minimum amount of error. To analyze steady state error, you must first make sure that the system is stable. And this is really important. So the system must be stable for you to be able to analyze steady state error. Otherwise, it would be difficult to say whether it's error or it's just the fact that the system's unstable that's causing it to, to blow up on you. Okay, let's take a look at an example here for, uh, as a laser disc recorder. I don't know, maybe Blu-ray or something sort of like that. This laser disc recorder, as shown at, at right here, what we have is we have um, a laser coming in. All right, this is your laser radiation coming in at right, and it has a polarizing beam splitter. So part of the radiation is actually being transmitted uh, upwards, and part of it goes straight um, through towards the right. So part of it goes this way. What happens is then is that part of this laser radiation actually goes out um, and touches the, the disc, so like a, a Blu-ray disc or a DVD or something like that, and then it bounces back and hits the other side of this beam splitter, and it along with the original radiation, actually goes up in this direction. Okay, so part of that light actually goes to one diode, and part of the light actually goes through the, the beam splitter and then to a mirror to the other uh, photodiode. What all a photodiode is, is a device that provides a voltage out here based on how much light it sees. Some photodiodes actually provide just a uh, variable resistance, but most just provide a voltage. All right. So what ends up happening is that if you measure, take the voltage we have here, like V1, and take here the voltage V2, and say, all right, well, I'm going to take the difference between the two, V2 minus V1. Well, if it's out of focus, then it turns out that what happens is that the, the voltage will actually be different, and it's a linear relationship. Um, if you look here, so if, say if it's five microns out of focus and one along one particular direction, the differential voltage is say 0 0.6 volts. The other way, it's at, at minus 0 0.6 volts. The idea is then is actually with this arrangement, you can actually um, adjust maybe this objective lens to move it back and forth so that we always work around in this range so that you actually get to watch whatever, uh, get a signal transmitted that you're able to use. A block diagram model of this is shown here, and how you would actually get to this model from the from the, the setup is a little beyond really what, what's important here. Uh, we have a detector that's just a linear gain. We have a filter here that has um, both a, a zero and a pole, and I hope you remember those things. And then we have a parameter gain, K1, and we have a power amplifier that just, again, is just a, a provides a, a hopefully a linear gain. And we have a motor and a lens. And we have uh, a couple of poles that represent the dynamics of that motor. Um, and so we get the desired lens position at left as an input and actual lens position as uh, an output at right. And notice we have unity feedback here. We're presuming that we can get the lens position where it's at right now and compare that to desired lens position easily. Okay. Now, the idea is once you're done with this, you'll be able to uh, determine the gain required to allow recording on a warped disk. 
So maybe the disk has a, has a warpage to it, and you'll, you'll be able to adjust the K1, K2, K3 uh, that are multiplied together in such a way that uh, this system works um, under without uh, too much error. Okay, so that's hopefully what some, uh, the sort of questions that you can answer is a consequence of learning what we're talking about today. Let's see. Error and control systems. The response of a system to an input can be divided into two components. You can say that it's the, the time-based response. It's here. Okay, so it's a time-based response and in the steady-state response. You have, as so in other words, you can say the total response of a system is equal to the transient plus the steady state response. Now, the transient part over time, okay, dies out. So if t goes to infinity, a limit of that, of a limit of y of t, y sub t of over time, as t goes to infinity, goes to zero. But the steady part, the steady state part, doesn't go to zero. So any of this that remains after a long time, okay, is just the steady state part. So y of t goes to y sub s s of t as t goes to infinity. If we say that the error is the difference between the desired output or the reference signal okay, and the actual output, and we write that as lowercase whenever it's in the time domain and uppercase whenever we have it written in the frequency or Laplace domain, then let's call the steady state error this function. e sub s s is defined as the limit as time goes to infinity of e of, e of t. This is, this is in the time domain. Now we could imagine all sorts of inputs to try to obtain some steady state error, but typically three particular uh, input waveforms are used. Usually we might use a step input where it actually steps like shown here. And, and what you might actually translate that is, is a constant position. We come along and suddenly we want to change the position of, uh, of an antenna dish or something. And the time function, well, we just would say the t, um, r, r of t is just equal to 1, as long as t is greater than or equal to 0. Laplace transform is 1 over s, for whatever that's worth. But we'll use that actually later on. But then we could also do some other basic trans, uh, uh, waveforms as well. We could have a ramp where it, it gradually changes over time. That's a constant velocity. And then we could also have a parabola, which represents a constant acceleration. And here we could have more complicated uh, behaviors like r of t is equal to I don't know e to, e to the to the t sine omega t and, and so forth, but those are not as easy to define as these three. And we can get a lot of information out of seeing what happens to the steady state error with just these three simple functions. The step input really represents like a movement of an aircraft's control stick or a smoothly opening a valve for ramp input or even tracking falling objects, say, for per parabolic input. Now, as we said, the steady state error is E sub S S as defined as limit as t goes to infinity of E of t in the time domain. But if we use Laplace transforms, like when we almost always do, we need what's called the final value theorem. And so you notice that you have F of t here. Well, we can write that if we say t goes to infinity of f of t, then that's equal, whatever value that ends up being, that's equal to limit as s goes to 0 of s times f of s. And this is, again, in the Laplace uh, transform theory. It's called the vinyl value theorem. And there's a proof here that's not on the exam um, that shows how this all works. But one thing that you have to have, f of s must have all but one pole in the left-hand plane for whatever your f of s is defined as. All right. And the point, reason we're actually going through this is that this f of t, well, this is e of t, and this t goes to infinity, well, that's the same as the t going to infinity here. And again, since we often work in the frequency domain, it would be handy to work with a steady state error from a frequency domain definition. So. If f of s has all but one pole in the left-hand plane, then we can write e of s is equal to, is defined as limit as t goes to infinity of e of t, but that also happens to be equal to limit as s goes to zero of s e of s. Okay. So this is our error in the time domain, error in, this, in the Laplace domain. Notice the extra s. Now, this doesn't make much sense if f of s must have all but one pole in the left-hand plane, but what we can say is that this 
only is true if the closed loop transfer function c over r is stable. So again, if we want to work in the Laplace domain and talk about steady state error, then we have to have the closed loop transfer function, the CLTF, right, CLTF, um, be stable. So let's look at what steady state error really steady state error really is. Ideally, right, for uh, a system that we we have, maybe we have a step input. Originally it was at zero, and now it's up at some value here. And this is notice that this is this is our input. Okay, so c of t goes to some value. Ideally, the output or r response to the system r of t would come up, and the error here, well, that's at zero, isn't it? Now, I have a different kind of uh, system with a different kind of output. Actually, there is a finite amount of error, and that's what we call e of ss. Okay? For a ramp input, it's a similar sort of situation, but it's just the lines end up being a little more difficult to draw. One thing we have is that uh, maybe, maybe the input is sl slowly increasing. Output one here shows that the steady state error actually goes to zero. Output two, well, the steady state error is actually a, f a finite and unchanging value. Over time, it actually goes to a constant value, the distance of separation, the, uh, separation between these two lines. However, the third output, in this case, ESS goes to infinity as T goes to infinity, doesn't it? So, so we can't define a steady state error really here because the system will slowly wander away from the input. If you try to write it for the parabolic system, it's a little more complicated, but it's the same idea. So where can you get steady state error from? Well, a lot of errors in control systems, steady state or not, are really arise from nonlinear interactions. Okay. In other words, the, the, the blocks that you might draw into the, the control system. Um, that incl those include backlash, like in gearing systems, uh, dead band in motors, so like you, uh, for example, if you have a little DC motor, um, it's supposed to run at 3 volts. If you put it 2 volts on it, it won't spin at all. Once you put uh, 2.7 volts on it, though, it suddenly starts turning. 3 volts, it's faster. 5 volts, it's much faster. So it's a region where you won't get any motion out of a motor. Hysteresis, meaning uh, a nonlinear response. If you put in X volts, you get uh, Y RPM out, but you put in 2 X volts, and you get 3 3 uh, 3y R RPM out. It's not linear. Friction is another source of problems, um, and that, that's it's also very common. And the unfortunate part of it is, is nonlinear systems are much more difficult to handle. In fact, uh, handling uh, control of systems with friction in them uh, has only really recently been cracked. And there are plenty of linear actions that give errors. So for the time being, we're actually going to uh, only worry about um, the behavior that happened to be linear. And later on, when you figure all that out and, and have all that uh, memorized, then you can go and worry about nonlinear systems uh, f uh, through additional study. Okay, so steady state error and block diagrams, what are we really talking about? If we look at the block diagram, the error, E of S is equal to R of S. So here's our error. E of S is equal to R of S minus B of S, presuming that we use the minus sign here. And that's equal to, right? If you've got your B of S, your B of S is equal to R of S, right? I'm sorry, your B of S here is equal to H of S, C of S, isn't it? Because here's your C of S, here's your H of S. And so we've substituted in for, for that here. And so H of S, C of S. And then we have R of S minus H of S, uh, G, E because C is equal to G times E, isn't it? So we had H before, so H, C is equal to H, G, E. So what this is doing is this taking us all the way back around this loop. So at the end of the day, what we have is we have E is equal to R minus H, G, E, and we can group on E here and here. And we can see then that E is equal to R over 1 plus GH. So the error, just based on the input and then the plant and then the feedback, 
is given by this equation. We've been able to get rid of our B and our, our, our output and our, our uh, feedback signal. So then the steady state error is really uh, defined by a limit as s goes to zero if s times e, e sub s, so presuming that this whole thing is stable, then that's the limit as s goes to zero of s times r, notice the s, extra s in here, s times r divided by one plus hg. And this again is only true if the closed loop transfer function c over r is stable. Okay, and that's the closed loop transfer function, not the open loop. Suppose we have unity feedback. Then let's, that, what that would mean is, is that this is just equal to one. Then we we'll notice that our h drops out uh, to one. Then e, e sub s s is equal to limit as s goes to zero of s r over one plus g. And as a consequence, the steady state error depends on the characteristics of g. I mean this r r. If we're limit or limiting ourselves to ramp, or say step, or parabola. Maybe we'll pick one of these and then say, well, really, the only thing that varies now is just g. So the g defines what's happening to our e. One of the things that we can look at with g that actually turns out to make a big difference on what happens here is the number of poles that g has at s equals 0. And we'll call this the system type. Okay. How many poles does this system have? Turns out that it has it has two, doesn't it? There's there's a pair right here. There's s is equal squared on the bottom, so we say that s squared here and gives a type of two. G1, right? If we look here, when s is equal to zero, okay. How many poles does this thing have? Well, that's only one, so it's type one. Here, well. It's type 3, isn't it? If we have a step input, r is equal to 0 if time is less than or equal to 0, and then equal to some sort of constant value, and I've used script r here uh, for that constant value, um, once time becomes greater than 0, then if we take the Laplace transform of this input, r of t, then so we get cap r of s is equal to script r over s, and then so the steady state error is equal to, right, it's s r over limit as s goes to zero of one plus g, right, presuming we have unity feedback. Then when we substitute in for this r, we end up with script r divided by s, and this s cancels out with that s, and we end up with that script r about a 1 plus g, limit as s goes to 0, right? And to get e if s s goes to 0, then the limit of this, limit of s goes to 0 of g of s, has to go infinity. This is just 1 here. On here, and we have this value that's unknown. This is just some sort of constant. So we have a constant over some value. Hopefully that would go to infinity to force this error to be zero. This means that at least one pole of this g of s must be at the origin. Well, there has to be one, at least one pure integration. Okay, so system type zero, we get the steady state error of script r over one plus lim limit of, of g of s as s goes to zero system type 2, then it turns out that their steady state error must always go to 0. Okay, because look, if you if you have a situation where you have 1 over s, say, okay, so there's one pole at the origin, and maybe that's your g. Limit, as s goes to 0 of this, actually goes to infinity, doesn't it? That's what we're talking about. So if your system type is 1, then you have at least one of these s's by itself that when you say s goes to zero, it doesn't really matter what else you have written in here. That s will force the whole function to go to infinity. If it's s squared, same difference. s cubed and so forth, you get the picture. Okay. 
If you don't have this, then what ends up happening is, is that it will go to some finite value. That's the point of having a, this equation written here. If we have a ramp input, then we replace the, the input with, instead of just having a script R here, we have a script R multiplied against T. So this is our input. So the script R again is a constant. And so over time, it's slowly increasing. And so then if we take the Laplace transform, we get script R over S squared. And our, our, our steady state error function here ends up being RS. Notice we have S squared now at the bottom. So that ends up being just R, which is a constant. So we can put the limit inside of here. R divided by 0, limit as S goes to 0 of 1, really of what happens there, right? Or limit as, S, I should say, limit as S goes to 0 of S. That goes to 0. And that's multiply. That's added to limit as S goes to 0 of S, G of S. We don't know what that value is quite yet. So to get, though, to get E of S, S goes to 0, the limit of this has to go infinity, same as before just the fact that this drops out now. So limit as s goes to 0 of s of g of s goes to infinity. That means that this s of g of s term has to have at least one s on the bottom of it. That means that the g by itself has to have at least two s's on, at two poles at the origin, in other words. So two poles at the, of g of s must be at the origin for this to actually occur so that we get the steady state error to be 0 for this sort of setup. And our system type then uh, for zero, if our system type is zero, meaning we have no s's at the bottom, then look at what happens. The limit as s goes to zero of s, and then there's no poles uh, at the origin to cancel out with that s. That means that'll end up going to zero. It means that if this goes to zero, the steady state error has to go to infinity because this is on, sitting on the bottom. So the steady state error will go to infinity if you have a system type zero for a ramp input. System, system type 1, well, this s will cancel with whatever s is in the g of s, and this will go to the error, then will go to some sort of finite value, r over limit as s goes to 0 of s times g of s. For system type 2, well, you have enough s's now on the bottom to actually cancel out with this s and then provide another pole uh, that's sitting at the 0, and have enough s's there so that this ends up going to infinity, and then therefore your e of s s actually goes to 0. Same thing for if you have three poles at the origin, four poles at the origin, and so forth. Similar sort of deal for a parabolic input. We have, uh, in this case, we put a half in there, uh, multiply against the script r times t squared, and a script r is a constant again. And so then when you have um, a convert over to the frequency domain, cap r of s is equal to script r divided by s cubed. And so then the steady state error is equal to uh, of script R S divided by S cubed times the quantity 1 plus G of S, and as limit as S goes to 0, then S cubed as limit S goes to 0 is just 0. The R, well, that's that's just going to be a constant, and we can actually uh, say that what we have here is we have S and is S squared, isn't it? So limit as S goes to 0 of S squared G of S, right? Then that's going to go to zero unless there's enough s's in here to actually on, on, on the denominator, in the denominator, in other words, having uh, enough poles at the origin to actually cancel out with that s squared. If we don't have that, then this is going to go to zero and this state state error is going to go to infinity. To get e sub s s equal to zero, then what we have to have is we have to have this function here actually go this function on the bottom here actually go to infinity, so that you have a constant over infinity, and that goes to zero. So for that to occur, then you have s squared g s has to be has to be some sort of stuff written on top, uh, maybe poles that are away from zero, but you have to have at least one pole at the origin to cause this to go to infinity. And if we put the s squared down here, we end up with s cubed, and so then you have stuff. Uh, you have zeros around and you have poles around in the, in the uh, forward part, the G, the plant, uh, transfer function itself, but you require S cubed at a minimum. This means that at least three poles of G must be at the origin. So for a system type of 0 or 1, 
then you're not going to have that. And so that means that this actually will end up, rather than going to infinity, will actually go to zero. Actually go to zero. So and when that goes to zero, that's zero plus zero on the bottom. That means the steady state error will turn out to go to infinity. When it's system type two, then it actually will go to some sort of finite value of error defined by this quantity, r script r divided by limit as s goes to zero of s squared t of s. And system type two means that in here someplace you have two poles at the origin, so there's one over s squared. That cancels out with this. And so then you take the whatever's left over uh, with the zeros and poles and g of s, take the limit as s goes to zero and see what you've got. That's a finite value for your steady state error. For system type three, four, five, and so on, the steady state error, in a manner similar to before, is actually end, ends up being zero. So if we just put it together in a table to actually maybe make a little more sense out of it, what you'll notice is, is that if we have step input, ramp input, acceleration input, or step, ramp, parabola, and then we look um, in the vertical axis, we have a type zero system, no poles at the origin, type one system, one pole at the origin, type two system, two poles at the origin, then the lower left-hand side here are all zeros. The upper right-hand side here are all infinities. Down the middle here, down the diagonal, we have finite values. So for a step input, a type zero system gives a finite error. For ramp input, a type one system gives a finite error. For acceleration input, a type two system gives a finite error. Otherwise, it, the, the, error is, the steady state error is either zero or infinity. If the, the type of the system is higher, then chances are it's going to be uh, have a zero state state error. If you start using uh, more uh, variable inputs into your system, chances are the state state error is not going to be zero. It may, go to, may well go to infinity. Very often, um, in, especially in uh, industry, they will use other terms instead of saying, what uh, the steady state error is, E sub S, well, you know, what's your steady state error, blah, blah, blah. They won't say that. They'll actually uh, assume that you already know that part and then go on and talk about static position step error constant. Um, and they'll talk about the velocity ramp error constant or static velocity error constant. And then they'll talk about the static acceleration parabolic error constant. And sometimes they'll even quote KP, KV, KA. And then, and then hopefully, you know, they, what they'll assume is that, you know, what they're talking about. Kp is the static position step error constant. K sub v is the static velocity ramp error constant. And then k sub a, oops, k sub a is the static acceleration parabolic error constant. All these really are is basically the, the business end of calculating this e sub ss, right? This is e sub ss. This is e sub ss. And this, this is what you would get down the diagonal here. K sub p is limit as s goes to zero, just g by itself. In case of V, you put in an extra S, and then in case of A, you put in an S squared. And these are also called, uh, just collectively, the static error constants. The static error constants indicate the ability of a unity feedback system to reduce or eliminate steady state error. And it's important to remember that if we're talking about unity feedback system. It's usually desirable to increase their constants while maintaining a desired trans, uh, transient response. So your k sub i, when they, those go up, that implies that your steady state error goes down. Oops. OK, so when your steady state error, static error constants go up, that means your steady state error is going down. When k sub i goes to infinity, and I'm, what I mean by i is it's either uh, the position or the velocity or the acceleration, I don't know which one it is. When this goes to infinity, that means that your steady state error has gone to zero. Introducing more than two integrators into the plan, what that's mean is just fancy talk for saying, okay, two integrators, all that really means is, is that one over s squared, okay, into the plan is generally difficult in practical uh, applications. So if you have your, your block diagram, then you say, oh, well, I'll be smart about it. I'll actually put 1s to the 15 in here. And then you have your plant, OK? And this is your output. And you have unity feedback, like that. And if this is 1s to the 15, say, well, this is the, you have that 
this could be a type zero, but if you have this and the controller, then that's fine. Then that means it doesn't really matter. The stationary error is always going to be zero because it says the 15th unless you have like some ridiculously complicated input. Doing this is really, really difficult in reality. It should be noted that the final value theorem is not valid for systems with sinusoidal input. So if we're talking about uh, what we're talking about later on is um, actually working in the frequency C domain in a way that where like a Bode plot or something like that, none of this works for the Bode plot, at least the way this is going. So there's no such thing as a sinusoidal error constant. Okay, It only works with these, these other types of behaviors and inputs. Okay, so we talked about steady state error, basically what it really means and with regard to the control system and especially uh, the, the different types of systems. But the error isn't necessarily just associated with uh, the difference between the input and the output. You also can have disturbances where something else is, is conspiring against you to actually get the system to do what you want. You have the input, you have the output, but then somewhere between the controller and the thing that you're trying to control, the plant, maybe you have disturbances that are that are occurring, maybe something in here that's messing up your connection. So these these are called D sub S, and we split the, 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 the plant controller combination G into G1 and G2. If we look at the output, well C is really equal to this G2 times D, right, because it maps back through you just see C is equal to G2, um, uh, G2D, but then, you know, with a plus in here, and you add in as well, the original input as a consequence of this error signal. G1, right, you go back from C, you get G2 times G1, G2 times G1, back through to E. So you add the two together and you get the, the whole uh, output of the entire system, not only due to the input, but also due to the, to the disturbance. So since the C is equal to R minus E, then we can actually go back and look at what the error signal would end up being as a consequence. Then the error signal is 1 over 1 plus G1, G2 times R, minus G2 over 1 plus G1, G2 times D. Okay. And what we've done, all we've really done here, is we've just gone back to look and see what our output signal is in terms of the input and the error signal, and then grouped or everything that has an error signal, there's your E, right, all on the left-hand side. Okay, so then the steady-state error, if this is our E, then we just use our definition, limit as S goes to zero of S times E as, as the, the definition for our steady-state error. When in doubt, that's all you have to do. You just use this definition and you look for what your, your error signal is. It's coming, it's going into your controller because that's what your, your controller is using to drive the whole system uh, to whatever state you want. All that really is then is just we put an S up here and we put an S over here because we have an extra S in here and then take the limit of all of this as S goes to zero as shown below. So the limit is S goes to zero over uh, of S divided by one plus G1 G2 times R minus the limit is S goes to zero of S G2 divided by one plus G1 G2 times D. This first term right here is called E sub S S R. It's the steady state error due to the due to the input. The second term here is called the the steady state error due to the disturbance. Notice the minus sign. The steady state error due to R, right, again, is just similar to previous definition. Especially if G was just G1, G2, if we didn't actually split these two apart, then it would be exactly the same as what we were written before. The steady state error due to the disturbance, though, is 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 quite a bit different than the, for the input. We have a minus sign in the first place, and we have the G2 the as a consequence of having the plant in between the disturbance and the output. If for example, the, step, uh, the disturbance is a step disturbance, then we could say for the at least the frequency domain or the, the Laplace domain, then the D of S is equal to 1 over S. And so then the steady state error, just purely due to the disturbance, is equal to what is shown below. We have 1 over S up here. We had an S above 
here, and then we can regroup a bit. We have limb as, limit as s goes to 0 of 1 over g2 of s, plus limit as s goes to 0 of g1 of s. So what that means is if you increase the steady state gain of g1, right, if you increase the steady state gain of your controller or decrease the steady state gain of your plant, you can end up with a reduction in the steady state error as a consequence of having a step disturbance. Here's an example. You might ask, is the system stable? The only way you can really find out whether the system is stable or not is to look at the closed loop transfer function. Right? And everybody remember what that is? Right? It's g over 1 plus gh. You have to look at the stability to that, either with Ruth Hurwitz or um, you know, some of the other methods that are available to you. Um, it turns out that, yes, all the poles are in the left-hand plane. And you can, if you worry about that, the best place that I've found to be looking um, at learning this is in Kuo Gonragi text. It's in the library, chapter 6, for a review of uh, figuring this all out. Since it's stable, then we know whatever error we get out of the system is just a consequence of, uh, as time goes to infinity, it's just a consequence of the design of the system, meaning that we, the steady state error has actually some sort of meaning. What's the steady state error due to a step disturbance? Well, that means E sub SSD due to a step. Well, if our D is a step disturbance, that's 1 over S, and we know what G2 is, we know what G1 is, we'll just substitute those in we end up with minus 1 over 1,000 as our steady state error. Again, the steady state error is inversely proportional to the DC gain of G1S. If you don't follow this, then, then write this one out by yourself by hand. We could do uh, similar analyses for ramp and parabolic disturbances. We won't in this class, and there's a couple of reasons. One is, is that it really there's not much additional information there. If you wanted to do it, it's not difficult to do and um, not much more really to talk about. Another reason is is that a lot of times the kind of disturbances that you would encounter are, are purely random in any case, and a step disturbance is perhaps most relevant to that situation. Now, most of these systems don't have unity feedback, so you're not able to say, well, an H you know, on your feedback loop is equal to 1. What do you do? And not, not only that, you can actually make things more complicated by having this, something like a G1 of S over here at the left. We convert those sort of systems into a unity feedback system if, uh, regardless. Remember, you know, your block algebra. The trick is to convert non-unity feedback systems into unity feedback systems. You have to do this because, see, whenever you have, if this isn't equal to, to 1, then this, this actuation signal, isn't equal to the error signal. It's actually something entirely different. Remember that the error signal is actually C right, minus R, isn't it? Is that right? It isn't, is it? It's R minus C. So we have to, first place, have C, and the second place, we have to have R. And we don't have either in this arrangement. So first thing we can do is we can push the input trans uh, transfer function g1 into the loop, then g is equal to g1 times g2, and then h is equal to h1 divided by uh, g1, as shown here. When you put it in through here, you have to say that, all right, this is actually now um, put in on both both sides, and it's multiplied against the top forward side and, and divided uh, on the, um, it's put in the divisor on the feedback side. To move a little farther, then we'll actually need to put in a unity feedback path because this is really what we want. At the end of the day, we want to have this is one we want, and we want to get rid of this one somehow. So the way you do that is put in and take out a unity feedback path. This is actually adds up to be zero, doesn't it? So if we do that, then we combine the minus one and HS blocks. Since these are in parallel, we just add them together. So H of S minus one is equal to h of s minus 1. That seems obvious. They're in parallel, so, uh, so you can put them together that way. We still have this, this uh, the one that we want. And then we combine the feedback and plant components. Okay, h s minus 1. And we flip it around. We bring it around onto the, to the forward side. 
and you notice that we have g divided by 1 plus gh minus g on the, on the forward side. So that we have e is equal to right, r minus c. And instead of writing e sub a as before, we actually are able to now write the true error signal from the output to, uh, to the input. Okay, here's an example. We have um, a setup here. Look at the system sta and stability. Look at the close-up transfer function. You can determine that. Turns out that it is. And here's your close-up transfer function, g over 1 plus gh, right? And yes, the system is stable. Remember that this is not, this is not the same as the open loop transfer function. And the open loop transfer function is gh, isn't it? The system is stable. And indeed, if we put in g and h, this is what we would have. And we used to do a little bit of algebra to try to simplify things out. And we notice that we end up with a cubic. Okay. Simplify a little bit more. And we look at the, the roots. So it turns out the roots are all on the left hand side for the denominator. Closed loop transfer function, therefore, is stable. The system is type 0, meaning that there is no um, s by itself on, in the denominator in this, in this uh, polynomial. So the steady state error then for this system, for a step input, limit as s goes to 0 of 1 over 1 plus g equivalent, that means that this has been converted to a unity feedback system, is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus 100 times 5 divided by 100. So it's 1 over 1 minus 5, meaning minus a fourth, isn't it? Or is it? Check. Ramp input, we have some, uh, it actually goes to inf infinity. Parabolic input, it goes to infinity as well. And this is consistent with the type 0 system. It'll have a finite steady state error for a step input, but for ramp and parabolic inputs, it'll actually have infinite steady state error. The system steady state error grows without bound for ramp and parabolic inputs then. So you can't rely upon it to actually give you an accurate response to uh, those inputs over um, a long period of time. Now, back to the particular problem we were talking about. Given the laser disk recorder shown earlier, then now, now with what you've been shown, you'd be able to find, for example, if the focusing lens must be positioned within 0 0.005 microns. And so what? how, how big is that? 0 0.005 microns, so let's see if that's 1, 2, 3, that's 5 nanometers, okay, 5 nanometers, so that means that's roughly, that's width of a virus, probably influenza is probably the best um, model of that. This also happens to be width of a few carbon nanotubes placed side by side. Or, for example, that's uh, 5 nanometers. Well, that's, that's about um, the width of a couple of DNA strands uh, as well. So, all right. Remember, we had in a block diagram the product K1, K2, K3. And we we're saying the warpage of the disk causes a change in the focus position of 15 uh, T squared microns. So this is a time function. It's meaning that you have a parabolic change um, um, in microns for your change of focus position. So what should that gain be? Is that overall gain? And you can distribute the, the total value of the gain amongst the different components, and probably K2 and K3 in particular are fixed. OK, so first step along the way is to use Ruth Thurwitz criterion to show your system is stable. And then we can use MATLAB to make sure. OK, this represents the solution here. Uh, it turns out that, um, all right, you have the input transforms in transform 15 t squared transforms into 30 uh, divided by s cubed um, uh, infinity. So e sub s s is equal to 30 divided by the acceleration constant uh, er, er, steady state uh, acceleration error, k sub a, and that's 0 0.005. So then your k sub a has to be equal to um, if you put that back in, it's 0 0.2 times 600 divided by 20,000. And it ends up meaning that our K1, K2, K3 has to be 1 million. And if we go back and look at the Ruth table, just to check and make sure that we're able to do talk in the first place about having a steady state error, it turns out the system is stable. And uh, we end up uh, in good shape there. 
But K1, K2, K3 has to be 1 million for this system. Give the response that you want. You can actually work this as an exam practice problem. You'll notice that throughout this class, um, um, in the lectures, there are actually exam practice problems. And you can, if you work these problems and, and are able to work these problems, you can pretty much assume that you're going to be ready for the exam. And this is one of those kinds of problems. Okay, and you can try it again for the second setup here to see how you go. Okay, the practice problem answers are given here, and as well, you can, here's another exam practice problem, and it's asking you a few questions, and it gives you the answer as shown here as well. You can look at the PDF file if you like to try to see what's going on. There's the third one, and this is with the disturbance input, and you can determine what's going on with it. Okay, here's the answers. All right. To summarize, state-state errors have been defined in terms of three test inputs, or uh, the step, the ramp, the parabolic inputs. When determining the state-state error, first, you must, must first have a stable system. Non-unity feedback systems are to be converted. Do not leave them as non-unity feedback systems and then start talking about state-state error, because state-state error has no meaning unless it's a unity feedback system. And they are to be converted into unity feedback systems for calculating the steady-state error. Disturbances can also be compensated for and affect the state state error of a control system. Okay, well, that was that part. Um, there are a few more parts of this first lecture, and uh, we'll continue um, in a moment. Thank you.